Normativity for positivists, as we all know, uh, there has been a huge debate, uh, jurisprudential debate on the topic of normativity of law, of legal normativity, in the last 30, maybe 40 years. And uh, of course, the question is, uh, uh, the question of the normativity of law is, is the law um, able to generate reasons, reasons for actions, obligations, duties, and uh, is the law authoritative in some sense? in a full sense or maybe in a weak sense, uh, provided that the law generates reasons, obligations, what these reasons are. Are legal reasons um, like uh, moral reasons or maybe are they exactly the kind of moral reasons or prudential reasons or are they a different kind of reasons altogether? So in the realm of reasons, we should count moral reasons, uh, prudential reasons, and also legal reasons with their autonomy, so to say. This is the bulk, I would say, of the normativity debate, which has received, uh, has included uh, several different positions. And I have to say, quite honestly, that uh, um, for one, I don't find this debate very illuminating. I'm not very satisfied with this debate. And um, of course, this is a general uh, bold statement, do exceptions allowed, uh, but I would say that generally this debate has been somewhat a wrong turn in jurisprudence in the last decades, and it does not contribute to illuminate uh, in a multiple, considerable way our understanding of the law, our insight and theoretical insights on the law. Sometimes it has been a bit confusing, I would say, um, sometimes uh, somebody has tried to import, to include, to use uh, in this jurisprudential debate philosophical tools whose fruitfulness, whose usefulness for the law is not very clear. Well, one, just one example, the planning theory of law by Shapiro, for instance. So all in all, all, in all I think that uh, there is some debunking to do, some deflating to do. Uh, on this debate and uh, of course I'm not alone in that I'm actually joining and building upon the efforts of others I think that it is a good idea to try to uh, deflate a bit this debate to uh, reduce it to some more uh, usable concepts and notions and what I would like to do is to uh, understand what kind of normativity uh, fits legal positivism uh, assuming that one is a legal positivist, as I am actually, uh, assuming that one subscribes some tenets of legal positivism, of course, it's not very easy to define what legal positivism is. Uh, somebody even denies that something as legal positive exists as a unitary uh, philosophical position. I assume that some thesis distinctively positivist there are, and uh, I, I actually subscribe to them. So I am a positivist and I think that it is possible to craft a concept of normativity that fits legal positivism. And this is what I will try to do in my presentation. So in uh, uh, respecting the uh, venerable tradition of analytical legal philosophy, we have to introduce some distinctions and definitions first then I will try to put them to use and then we will draw some conclusions. This is the basically the uh, simple structure of my presentation. So let's start with some definitions and distinctions that can be useful for my for the intelligibility of my argument. So uh, normativity has, the, has to do with, uh, with reasons, of course, uh, like I said, is the ability of law uh, of, to produce reasons reasons for actions, for instance. So what kind of reasons are at stake in the debate on the normativity of law, in the normativity debate? Generally, we can distinguish between normative reasons and motivational reasons. Of course, the distinction uh, is, uh, well, prima facie sensible, but uh, not always easy to draw. And somebody also, in, uh, for somebody it's controversial is not so for somebody it's not so obvious that you can distinguish these kind of reasons i uh, for the sake of argument i'm assuming that we can and uh, at least in many cases or in some cases and so um, 
normative reasons are justificatory reasons, are the reasons that can be used in order to evaluate something, an action, a decision, as a state of affairs, uh, evaluate as right or wrong, uh, good or bad, and so on and so forth. So whenever we in, are engaged in an evaluation of this kind, generally speaking, so this is good, this is bad, this is right, this is wrong, blah, 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 we are assuming or we are using normative reasons. Normative reasons do just that. They, uh, they can be used in a justification or in an evaluation. Motivational reasons are reasons or explanatory reasons are reasons that uh, are mental states, for instance, that cause an action or a decision. Okay, so we refer to motivational reasons when we want to explain causally, in a causal way, uh, the, some kind of why an action has taken place and so on and so forth. Of course, the normativity debate is concerned only with normative reasons, as far as I know, at least, but it makes sense. The normativity debate asks whether the law creates normative reasons, and of course, what kind of reasons are those? What kind of normative reasons are those? So in the uh, remaining, in the reminder of my, of my presentation, I will, when I will talk about reasons, I will always assume that you are talking about normative reasons. Okay, uh, another distinction, another useful distinction is between complete and incomplete reasons. Uh, a complete reason is a complete that is, that is able, potentially able, uh, to provide a conclusive answer to the question, why should I do that? Uh, why is, is this right or wrong, etc., etc. When I use a complete reason, I can have a conclusive answer to such questions, to questions such as this. Uh, of course, um, I would like to uh, be clear about that, a, co a complete reason, uh, so a reason which is, that is um, able to work as a conclusive reason, need not be an absolute reason. A complete reason can be defeated by another complete reason. Okay, this is why I said uh, complete reasons are able to work as conclusive, to, key to provide conclusive answers to questions such as this, such as uh, is this right or wrong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Able, they are able to, but of course they can uh, be in conflict with other complete reasons, and so we have to uh, open a balance of considerations in this case. Then, of course, we have, we have incomplete reasons. An incomplete reason, quite clearly, is a reason that is not able to provide a conclusive answer to the question, is this right or wrong, what should I do, and so on and so forth. So, when uh, I am faced with a question such as, is this right or wrong, and I use an incomplete reason in order to answer this question, the answer works, but it still makes sense to keep on asking, yes, but why, okay? When I have a complete reason, it does not make sense to ask, yes, but why? The complete reason is conclusive, at least potentially. An incomplete reason, on the other hand, is not conclusive. It provides an answer, but the question can still be open, meaning, meaningfully open. It, is, it, is, it still makes sense, it can still make sense to ask, Yes, but why? And the justificatory process goes on until we find what? Until we find the complete reason that closes the justificatory process. Third distinction is in the realm of normativity, uh, the ability to produce justificatory reasons, of course. Uh, a distinction that, again, makes sense, uh, at least uh, makes initial sense, makes uh, at first sight it makes sense, but. Uh, Admittedly, it's not so easy to state in a fully articulate way. So uh, don't ask me to do that, please. Uh, it's a distinction between strong normativity or weak normativity. Let's start with weak normativity. Weak normativity uh, occurs uh, whenever there is, a, let's say, a practice, for instance, 
that incorporates criteria of correctness of any kind, rules, standards, uh, and so on and so forth. So whenever we have a practice that incorporates criteria of correctness, then the practice is endowed with weak normativity. So something can be judged correct or incorrect, right or wrong, in the face of that practice. As we can see, as we, it's easy to see, weak normativity is uh, anywhere in our social world. Language, language is a practice that incorporates rules. And so we can have correct, linguistically correct or incorrect utterances, okay? According to the rules of language. Games, fashion, etiquette, and so on and so forth. Uh, once, um, at, um, as soon as we uh, grasp the concept, we are able to see weak normativity anywhere in our social world, okay? Mm. On the other hand, strong normativity is, uh, um, is, is a bit different. It's not easy to define, but is, is more demanding and uh, obtains when we have considerations according to which something can be judged right or wrong, uh, good or bad, and so on and so forth, uh, considerations that apply, let's say, to everybody, uh, not in association to the participation to some practice. So considerations that apply to every human being or to every rational being, at least supposedly. So as a consequence, weak normativity is conditional normativity. It applies only to those who take part to some social practice, to participate, to partake to a social practice. So the rules of the Italian language apply to me only if I want to speak Italian. The rules of chess apply to me only if I want to play chess and so on and so forth. They are conditional in this sense. Strong, uh, normativity, strong normative reasons uh, are unconditional. They apply to everybody or at least to any uh, rational human being. The concept of strong normativity is controversial. No, but not everybody agrees that there are, there is any such thing in the world that uh, meets the requirement of strong normativity. For somebody, not even morality has strong normativity. For the sake of argument, for the sake of argument, I assume that there are things that have strong normativity. And I will give some example shortly. So it, uh, for the sake of, at least for the sake of argument, I will assume that it is sensible to distinguish between strong and weak normative considerations and that some things have strong normativity. So let's try to combine quickly these definitions and distinctions and we see that Strong normativity, if something has strong normativity, it produces complete reasons. Reasons that are at least potentially conclusive. They give a, an at least potentially conclusive answer to the question, why should I do that? Is this right? Is this wrong? Et cetera, and so on and so forth. The uh, most commonly, um, the examples, the instances of complete reasons that are most commonly referenced to, that are mo most com commonly mentioned, are of course morality and prudence or self-interest. So morality and self-interest or prudence are said to be the kind of things that can be, that can work as complete reasons, that can provide conclusive answers to the question, why should I do that? Uh, it does not, it would not make sense if I, in front of the question, why should I do that? Or is this right or wrong? And if I give the answer, because morality says so, because this is the morally right thing to do, it does not make sense to keep on asking, yes, but why should I do what morality asks? Unless, of course, there are at stake other conflicting moral considerations other considerations of the same kind, or even considerations of self-interest, okay? Other potentially complete reasons. But absent other complete reasons, it does not make sense to keep on asking, yes, but why? 
There is an important difference between moral considerations and self-interest considerations for our concerns. Uh, in principle, moral considerations, moral reasons can provide conclusive, uh, complete reasons for any kind of, uh, for any kind of uh, normative question. Okay, uh, so if I assume that something is morally required, I can make reference to moral uh, to morality in any kind of considera normative consideration. Prudence or self-interest does not work like that. Like that, uh, it is widely uh, there is a widely shared uh, belief assumption uh, that prudence, uh, self-interest can be uh, referenced to can be invoked only uh, in order to justify. Uh, judgments, decisions, considerations that are self-regarding, okay? So I can justify, and we are in the realm of justificatory reasons, okay? Not motivational reasons. I can justify my course of action, a course of action that involves only me, on self-interest consideration. This is perfectly fine, but I cannot justify upon self-interest considerations, the imposition of obligations on other people. I cannot ask other people to do something. I cannot hold responsible other people to do something on consideration of my own self-interest. Unless there is an exception, unless other people are under a moral obligation to act for my well-being. But this would be a moral requirement, not anymore a self-interest consideration. Okay. On the other hand, when something has or is endowed with uh, weak normativity only, it can generate just incomplete reasons. So if something has weak normativity, it generates normative reasons that, needs, that, that to, need to be supplemented with complete reasons i.e. morality or prudence, in order to give a definite conclusive answer to the question, is it right or wrong, uh, is, uh, should, should I do that, and so on and so forth. Okay, this is the general picture. Let's go to the law now. Uh, of course, it is uh, considered almost a true, well, basically a truism, uh, at least by heart here. This is a quote from the concept of law, page six, that the law, is in some sense makes whenever the law there is the law it makes some certain kinds of human conduct of human behavior in some sense obligatory uh, this uh, we could uh, um, stipulate that this is maybe the uh, birth of the normativity debate uh, uh, the normativity debate draws or at least at the beginning uh, has drawn heavily on some hints by heart. This is one. The other is, the, of course, the distinction between internal and external points of view. Another one is the famous distinction between being obliged and having an obligation and so on and so forth. It's interesting that Hart was very um, eclectic, very open-minded on this point. Is here that in the word some, in some sense obligatory, is in the italics in the original. So, Hart says, I'm not committed to do any specific view on the normativity of law. I'm not saying it's moral. I'm not saying uh, it's uh, in some sense. The problem is that in some sense, there is an obligation. OK, so this is the very problem of law's normativity. Does the law create the normative reasons? Of course, it does. We have already found the, the um, answer in Hart. And OK. Of course, there are some strengths, for instance, in, in, uh, some strengths in legal realism, for instance, that exclude that law creates reason at all. But mm, according to, a, to the mainstream position, let's say, uh, which needs not to be the correct one, but it's there. So we discuss that, that, that assumption, that position. Uh, yes, it, the law creates normative reasons. Justificatory reasons. So the answer to this, to the, first, to the first question is yes, the law has some has normativity. But what kind of normativity? Of course, 
because now here the, the, the real problem. Uh, the real problem is what's exactly the normativity, what does exactly amount to the normativity of law? Is it a strong normativity or is it, or is it a weak normativity? I think, so of course, uh, translating uh, what we have said so far, that is the law able to provide complete reasons or only incomplete reasons? Uh, reference to the law is or can be conclusive to a normative questions, to question or not. I think that here we have a very easy answer to this question. Mm, very, very easy. I think it's not too easy. I, I hope it's not too easy, but it's very easy. Uh, when we ask, what should I do? Or uh, is this the right thing to do? Or is this right or wrong? Of course, the law gives reasons, gives a way to answer. We can say, this is wrong because the law says so. Or it's wrong because it is the law, okay? You have to do that because it is the law. This answer makes sense, of course. But still, it makes sense to keep on asking, yes, this is the law, but why should I do what the law says? This question, I think, to my mind, at least, makes perfect sense. While we have seen that it does not make sense to in front of the answer, this is right or wrong because morality says so, it does not make sense to ask yes, but why? But why should I do what morality requires or what self-interest requires? It does not make sense to ask this kind of question. On the other hand, it makes, it seems to me, perfect sense to keep on asking, yes, but why should I do what the law says? So if that is so, there is a very simple, straightforward argument that enables us to say that the law can give only incomplete reasons. The law is a, a, only a weakly normative phenomenon, does not create per se, does not create as such conclusive, uh, complete reasons for action or justificatory reasons. It can create conclusive, complete reasons only in conjunction with other reasons. And what reasons are those? Of course, reasons of morality, moral reasons, or reasons of prudence, self-interest. So the law can create, can give a conclusive reason, a complete reason, can become a strongly normative phenomenon only in conjunction with, mo with either moral or prudential considerations. As such, taken by itself, the law is not, appears not to be able to create complete reasons. Now, uh, I think that, uh, sorry, Mattia, uh, how much time do I still have? We've gone over the, the time clock, but if you're able to, to you know. Uh, uh, we are already, I'm already done. <laughs> Am I ready <laughs> with my time? You should finish your argument, but yeah. I, I will go very quickly and I will be, I will be available uh, in the Q&A. A part of the, of, the, of the session. Okay, sorry about that. I'm terrible in giving short presentations, so it is clear. So um, I think that now it is interesting to distinguish between the situation of the citizen and the situation of the officials. Now, if we want to understand a bit, look at a bit closer at the question of the normativity of law. Once we have uh, accepted that uh, law is normative only in a weak sense, the, this, the, the, the problem bifurcates, so to speak. Because what kind of other considerations can be marshaled, marshaled uh, in order to make the law fully normative? From the point of view of the citizens, it can be may, uh, both, or, well, either prudential considerations or moral considerations can be uh, marshaled, okay? Can be used to back the normative claim of the law. So I have a conclusive reason to do what the law says only if that is on my, in my self-interest, or only if the law meets some moral requirements. 
these are the only uh, cases uh, which, from the point of view of the citizen, I have a conclusive reason to do what the law says. Not the same goes for officials. Officials uh, don't want to use the law in order to take decisions for themselves, like the, like the citizen, like the citizens, but they use the law in order to evaluate the actions of others and to impose obligations on others. And we have said that, I have said some minutes ago, that uh, only moral considerations can back the imposition of obligations on others. Prudential considerations will not do the job, cannot be used in order to justify the imposition of duties on others. As a consequence, in order to be fully normative, uh, to fully justify a judicial decision, the law must be coupled with normative consideration of moral kind, with moral considerations, which means that ultimately, a justif ultimately, a justified judicial decision or official decision ultimately is grounded on moral reasons only, not uh, on uh, prudential reasons. We are talking about justification, not about motivation. Uh, so in a word, judicial decisions are ultimately grounded upon ideals of, of moral legitimacy of the system, of, on some belief on the moral legitimacy of the system. I will go to close my presentation now, uh, just saying that these uh, uh, stance, that stance on legal normativity that I have tried to outline here, um, has some interesting jurisprudential implications for the concept of legal norm, for the concept of legal validity, and for the separability thesis, well, for, for legal positivism in general. Um, very quickly, legal norms are norms only in the weak sense, not in the strong sense. So they are uh, norm uh, in the weak sense of normativity. They provide criteria of correctness conditionally under the condition that one wants to partake in the legal practice. Legal validity amounts, can amounts only to membership to legal system and not also to bindingness. And legal positivism is, uh, as it should be, uh, a thesis only about the identification and the existence of the law and not about the justification of bindingness of the law. When uh, we want to introduce in our jurisprudential discussions uh, considerations about the normative the bindingness of the law, uh, we go outside the law, we need to use extra legal considerations moral or prudential, and also we go outside legal positivism. Legal positivism is not, is committed only to, I think, to a weak uh, sense of the normativity 